Okay, everybody. So good afternoon and thank you all for joining us. My name is Reno Lopez and today I represent both the International Society for Gesture Studies Hong Kong and the Department of English and Communication of the Hong Kong Polytechnic University, both of them organizers of this event. So just to repeat what I said uh, a couple of minutes ago, we are recording, so just, uh, just to bear that in mind. And um, Tanya will be speaking for about 40 minutes or so, and we will have 20 minutes of questions and answers at the end. If, uh, if you're having any problems, if you cannot hear or cannot see properly, just send a message to the chat to, to let us know. Same thing with the questions. If you have any questions um, whilst Tanya is speaking, just make a note of them in the chat so we can come back to them later at the end. Um, we hope that, yes, we will be able to share the lecture um, when we finish, once it is edited and if Tanya agrees to share. So, let me, let me then introduce um, Dr. Tania Smotrova. Um, it is our pleasure to have her speak uh, to, to all of us today. She's lecturer at the National University of uh, Singapore, and she has a PhD in applied linguistics from Penn State University in the US, and also a master's in teaching English and French language and literature. And this, this is important because in her work as a second language pedagogue and researcher, she's able to combine these two field, fields, covering many aspects of uh, the teaching and learning cycle, including academic writing, English, excuse me, in the globalized world, uh, translation issues, However, her main focus for over a decade now has been how gestures are used by teachers in the classroom for pedagogical purposes in teaching vocabulary, pronunciation, sequencing stories, and also to manage instruction. Her latest work and the one that she will be presenting today explores student-teacher collaborative gestures in the classroom. You can find her work in journals like the Modern Language Journal, TESOL Quarterly, Journal of Pragmatics, so basically all the good ones. And if you have been following the activities of the International Society for Gesture Studies Hong Kong, and I hope you have, and I hope you have become a member or will become a member, uh, you would have heard her speak at our recent panel on gestures and teaching and learning at the sixth um, LSPPC a few months ago. So without further ado, Tanya, I hope I haven't said anything wrong. And I'll let you tell us more about gestures for co collaboration and effective alignment in the language classroom. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Renya, for introducing me. And uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. I didn't really expect that many people. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, can I share my screen now? OK. Uh, I've also planned to make it. Uh, can you wait? Sorry, you have undone the screen. You were sharing a minute ago, and now you stop sharing. Yes, I stopped sharing. Oh, OK, good. <laughs> OK. Uh, yes, so. Um, uh, I was planning to, I was planning to make it interactive. Uh, I'll see if it's possible with that many people. Uh, so today we are going to talk about. Let me share my screen now. Today, we are going to talk about a gesture for collaboration and effective alignment in the language classroom. And here's our plan for today. First, um, first I have a warm up question for you to lead us into this topic. Uh, next, we will talk about the relationship between cognition and emotion. Uh, and I'll introduce the notion of collaborative 
dialogue and then to see how it how gesture plays into collaborative dialogue we are going to watch and discuss an extended example of collaborative dialogue to see how collaborative dialogue uh, also involves effective alignment and then uh, we will talk more about a specific mechanism of collaborative dialogue and effective alignment, which I labeled as CD and AA. Uh, we will talk about catchments. And I will show more examples of their functions. And uh, I will conclude with recommendations for language educators to show that um, we can that these theoretical um, conclusions are relevant to our practice of teaching. So uh, let me start with a warm up question. Uh, how many of you like off topic questions? Uh, I always like off topic questions, especially in the evening. So the question uh, I'd like you to think about, and maybe I'll just ask some of you to unmute and share just a couple of you. Uh, what was your favorite subject in secondary school and why? Um, maybe I could ask uh, Renya, <laughs> you are here. I knew, I knew you would be asking me. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it was probably math. And uh, it, it was not thanks to the teacher at all. And um, it was actually just the subject. So, so why, why was it your favorite? Uh, and everyone, uh, thank you so much for your answers in the chat. Can you, it's crucial that you indicate why, why? Why? Mm -hmm. um, mm, I like the logical element of it. <laughs> the logical element of math, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so that's uh, that's. And how did you choose uh, uh, to learn English? I didn't. No choice. <laughs> no choice. No, we didn't have a choice. I see. So I have. Uh, thank you so much, Renya. We have some uh, answers in the chat. Many answers. Uh, uh, art class. The teacher who always gave thought-provoking tasks. Uh, English because the teacher is pretty and humorous. Uh, in, then we have sports because it's outside, right? And for me, uh, uh, I also I also loved English. Obviously, I chose it as a major, and my answer is uh, similar uh, because uh, you know I went to school during the Soviet Union, so. Um, people were dressed in a very similar way, but English teachers were different. They were very colorful. They were wearing makeup and they always smiled, looked very happy. That's why I enjoyed it and, and I chose it as a uh, major. We have also an answer, French, because of the idea of travel and culture. So we can, and literature, I wanted to become a poet. So we can see that even though we usually think of, um, you know, school subjects as a cognitive thing, but in these answers, we can see that there's a lot, a lot of emotion uh, mentioned. A lot of emotion mentioned. So uh, what is the relation? So when we think about now English language learning, right? And many of you mentioned it. Uh, previous studies mostly and currently the field mostly focuses on the cognitive processes and uh, Meryl Swain in her plenary speech 2013 um, dwells in detail on the role of emotions in English language learning. So even though the focus is on the cognitive side, but uh, we can see in our examples here in our experience and also in the recent uh, studies in psychology that actually cognition and emotion are interconnected specifically. And uh, Duncan and Barrett uh, go as far as to claim that affect is a form of cognition. And how is that? Because affect has such uh, cognitive functions as 
normal uh, conscious experience always involves uh, effect, language, fluency, and memory. And we can see that especially the, these two are very relevant to the language, language learning. And uh, uh, these the recent findings uh, in psychology actually coincide with something that Vygotsky, uh, the Russian psychologist Vygotsky, the founder of uh, sociocultural theory, uh, he talked about it a century ago that cognition and emotion are actually interconnected and emotions are integral part of cognition. Moreover, this system is a dynamic system of meaning where the affective and intellectual unite. And uh, it involves uh, co-constructed, the emotion and cognition are co-constructed. It's an event in progress. Uh, therefore, it's uh, interpersonal and interpersonal, uh, we can take it as a synonym of dialogical as Meryl, Meryl Swain says. So when we think about classrooms, uh, then uh, this is very relevant, the dynamic uh, interaction and co-construction, uh, because in the classrooms, what's happening is that in the best case, right, uh, the teachers and students, teacher and students collaborate to achieve a shared goal as they jointly work on language learning tasks. So it's actually uh, supposed to be a collaborative dialogue where speakers are engaged in creation of new knowledge and uh, problem solving using the word Mary Swain's uh, world. Uh, that's in such collaborative dialogue, they build upon each other's contributions. And in this dialogue, uh, we uh, align with a perspective that in this collaborative dialogue in the classroom, cognitive and emotional processes are uh, constituted. So uh, they are fulfilled through collaborative uh, dialogue. So, uh, and Meryl Swain uh, thinks aloud, sort of thinks aloud, we can call this collaborative dialogue, she uses two versions. We can call it as a cognitively permeated set of emotional press processes, but we can also think about it as emotionally permeated set of cognitive processes. So uh, to see uh, how gesture plays into this uh, collaboration where um, uh, both cognition and emotions are co-constructed in dealing with, in trying to achieve a shared learning goal. Um, I'd like us to start with a video because uh, I'm not sure how much background we probably all present here. We probably have different uh, backgrounds in uh, gesture studies, different level of familiarity. So instead of talking about gesture, I think it's better that we look at gesture first. So I'd like us to uh, watch a video and try to analyze together. I hope it works. Again, I've never done it with that many people. Uh, when, you, when we watch this video, I'd like you to think about these three big uh, collaboration, effort, and gesture, specifically in, in terms of collaboration. Can this interaction be considered a collaborative dialogue? As for effect, is effect involved in this interaction on both sides, uh, teacher and student? And of course, importantly, does gesture play a role in these two? Okay, are you? ready to watch a video. I think maybe you're not so ready because I'd like to provide uh, some context for this video, where the data comes from. Uh, the data was uh, recorded in the US in an intensive English program. So the, those of you who are not familiar with this program, this is a program for adult learners from different countries who are preparing to enter uh, U.S. university, and they need to improve 
uh, their English, uh, so the program prepares them. And uh, the students that you will see come from different countries and they are in a beginner level reading class. Uh, what about the teacher? The teacher is an L1 English speaker. L1 means uh, native language. And she is very experienced. She has over 10 years of teaching experience. I think someone has to mute. Okay, thank you. Uh, 10 years of teaching experience. And uh, uh, by the way, currently she, uh, she's not teaching in this program, but she's doing teacher training and she was considered one of the best teachers in the program. So uh, specifically about this excerpt, uh, the students had to read a uh, text about cat owners. And again, uh, we realize it's um, beginner level. They were supposed to read a text about cat owners. So in the excerpt, the teacher will ask them, will ask them what's the main idea of the text? What's the main idea of the text? And uh, first, uh, she she gives a clue, but she's a little bit tongue-tied, so don't don't be surprised at what she says. And then the student will try to respond. So uh, let me play the video twice, just uh, so you got a general impression. And then I'll ask you uh, after you watch. Twice, I'll ask you about these uh, three things. Can you see whether it's collaboration or not? Can you see anything? You can share anything related to collaboration, effort, and uh, gesture in relation to these two. Okay? All right. Okay, so uh, please focus on uh, the teacher and the, this student, okay? So they are talking about cat owners, the text is about cat owners and a relationship, you will hear this word. Uh, what, what was this? Uh, <laughs> a relationship between uh, cats and uh, owners. Cats. Oh. Cat owners. Yeah, there you go. Okay, let me play it one more time. Uh, what what was this? Uh, uh, relationship between uh, cats and uh, owners. Cats. Oh. Cat owners. Uh, yeah, there you go. Okay. So um, just on the surface, I can see some answers. Uh, anything you noticed in relation to collaboration, effort, and uh, gesture? Just the first impression. Okay, I, I can see Albert says, the gestures used are supportive of language production. Anything else you notice? on the surface. Okay, so maybe CD and AA. <laughs> okay, facilitating responses from the student. It can lower students' nervousness. Okay, so that's related to effect. A teacher seems happy to get the answer. Teacher uses gesture to elicit the response and helps with the correct word sequence. It's about knowledge building. Mm -hmm. Makes a goofy face. The teacher makes a goofy face to acknowledge her own jumbled words. And teacher copies student's gesture. Repeats, yeah. Also the gaze of the teacher, she showed interest. Okay. To suggest the psychological barriers i'm not so sure mm. okay so thank you so much i i can see encouraging smiles yes encouraging smiles and the gestures for both are almost the same 
Uh, thank you so much. You mentioned a lot of important aspects related to both uh, collaboration and uh, effort. And uh, so let me analyze uh, more, produce more analysis, and uh, you will see whether you have more questions that we can discuss. Okay, so what I'm going to do now, uh, instead of using a transcript, uh, I'd like to walk you through the video and uh, uh, analyze on the way. So I will use a uh, slow motion and um, I will uh, explain what's going on and analyze. Okay, so uh, it begins with a teacher asking a question, uh, giving a clue, okay? So first, uh, what happened before the excerpt? is she asked, what's the main idea of the text? What's the main idea of the text? And then the student answered before the excerpt, uh, it presents the results of a scientific study. So here the teacher starts to clarify. So uh, what was this? And uh, she became tongue tied, but as she says, what was this? She is using a gesture, okay? She's using this gesture. And this gesture actually carries an important semantic information. We can see it's a, a metaphorical gesture that shows two entities. And the way the student replies, he uh, is starting to say r, r, and then he says relationships. Uh, but his answer, we can see he interprets this gesture as a metaphor for, metaphorical gesture for relationships. Okay, uh, so this uh, could serve as a clue for him, as a clue for um, the meaning of uh, the word. And so he begins to answer, he says, re, re. And as he uh, starts to produce the answer, you can see he imitates the teacher's gesture. But because you can see here that the teacher is looking away from the student because she's uh, trying to formulate and maybe that's why he drops his hands. And only when they establish a mutual gaze, he produces, imitates the teacher's gesture again, and he produces the correct answer to relationship, okay? At this point, uh, you can see the teacher is still holding the relationship uh, gesture in the mutual field. And you can see that two more students attend uh, and this student seemed to attend to the teacher's gesture. So that's one of the advantages of gesture. Uh, teacher's gesture is produced in a shared space so that uh, uh, the whole class, if not the whole class, but many students can attend to it. Uh, so once uh, the student says relationship, then he starts to uh, specify what are these two entities that he signifies with these both hands. So then he says uh, the first word, uh, cats, I think he says cats. You mean uh, cats? Yes, yeah, so he says cats and uh, gestures to the left. You can see that the teacher synchronously repeats uh, mimics the student's gesture. And then he produces the second entity. He gestures to his right and says, And the uh, owners. Owners. Uh, so all the way before that, you can see that the teacher and student have been gesturing synchronously. And teacher's gesture, she was also nodding. So we can see both in a gesture, hand gesture, and in her nodding, the teacher acknowledged the student's response. You can also see that uh, both of them are uh, half smiling, okay? So it's more like a friendly kind of uh, uh, atmosphere or facial expression. But then after cat and owner, he says, owner, cats. You can see that the teacher's facial expression changes when she heard, hears the incorrect order. There's a change. She becomes very serious. Okay. And then what she does next, 
uh, at this point, the uh, we can say before that there was a synchronous kind of dance where imitate, they imitate each other and smile. And then at this point, the synchronization actually uh, breaks down, which uh, can be taken as a signal for trouble. And what the teacher does next is that she moves her hands uh, upward and creates an arc, right? And she also points with her fingers. So, um, and indicating that uh, he needs to switch the, uh, switch the words, the word order. So this is really interesting because before that, the transformation of the metaphorical gesture, because before that her open hands, two palms indicated the relationship, right? The two entities. However, once the error uh, occurs, uh, this metaphorical space changes into a syntactic structure because uh, the, the teacher use it, it uses it to indicate the correct syntactic slots of the words, cat owner instead of owner cats. So we can see that the gesture as a tool, uh, it, which is always available for the teachers, is a very flexible uh, tool that can be used for pedagogical Purpose, purposes. Then what happens with the uh, student? With the student, we can see that he begins to uh, imitate. Uh, so first, he doesn't produce the correct answer. The teacher said, okay, maybe I'll play what she says. Okay. Cat owners. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, cat owners. So he doesn't, the student doesn't produce the correct answer. It's a different student, this one, who says, verbalizes the answer. However, when we look at the student's hands, you can see that he mimics the teacher's correction gesture. We can, actu we can actually consider this as a, a as an uptake, but this uptake is not seen in his verbal part. It is only seen in on his hands. But then here, uh, let me play the conclusion. You can also see that uh, uh, they resume smiling. Once the issue is resolved, they uh, resume smiling. And then something happens. Owners, yeah, yeah there you go. Uh, what, what was this? Uh, yeah. Uh, and then when uh, the other students realized that he was confused, uh, teacher's uh, gesture and his imitation, they produce uh, humor. And so uh, the excerpt ends with uh, students laughing and the student who made an error is laughing himself. Uh, so we can see effect involved. Uh, so to summarize this excerpt, to summarize, what happened in this excerpt is that the teacher used metaphorical gesture depi depicting the lexical relationship as a clue for student response. Uh, the student imitated the catchment and used it as a mediational tool while elaborating on his response. And then the teacher used students' catchment to acknowledge for acknowledgement. Uh, they also produce joint strokes. Strokes is the strongest uh, gesture on uh, certain words, on cats and owners, and they did it synchronously. Uh, and they showed agreement through imitation and synchronization. And then once there was disagreement, this, uh, there was a breakdown in both synchronization and uh, imitation. Uh, as a sign of understanding, the student imitates uh, the gesture. So uh, I think what we can see, I believe what we can see here in terms of effective alignment in, first, in terms of um, effect, uh, the following things are very important. First, the mimicry. 
and I'll bring some psychological, uh, some studies in psychology to talk about these uh, effective aspects. First, uh, mimicry. Uh, mimicry is mm, related to rapport uh, because shared uh, Chartran and Van Baren say that shared motor movements and rapport are positively correlated. Simply speaking, we mimic people that we like, and when people mimic us, we like them more. <laughs> Something to think about. So mimicry is important. Then synchrony, the fact that they gesture synchronously and have strokes synchronously. This has also implications for our effect. To move with one another is to show that one is with him in one's attention and expectations. And we know that attention is very important for learning. And uh, it also, uh, it's also helps to build rapport. Uh, and lack of synchrony can signal trouble. Uh, synchrony. Then uh, lastly, uh, all of these are important for effective alignment. Uh, by mimicking, moving in synchrony, the teacher and student created rapport, trust, and added a humorous element. And we can also see effect shared by other uh, students. Uh, yes, and I think what's important uh, here as well in effective alignment that um, gesturing may help to build uh, uh, Gesturing in collaboration, synchrony, mimicry may help to build trust between the teacher and student, uh, and it can help to reduce fear of error, as one of you mentioned, and uh, creating a positive atmosphere. So to conclude about this excerpt, I think what we can see here using Meryl Swain's words is uh, co-constructed creation of emotions in a dialogue as this is interwoven with the collaborative thinking process. And we can see that uh, here um, emotions are socially constructed and uh, they, they are likely to mediate uh, learning outcomes. Of course, this is uh, just um, moment to moment interaction, uh, but this is just to trigger our thinking and we can see uh, how, uh, whether it can help in the uh, long term. So where does the notion of effective alignment come? Because I haven't really uh, uh, de defined effective alignment. Uh, in his socio-cognitive framework, uh, Dwight Atkinson uh, focuses a lot on alignment. Uh, alignment for language learning. And uh, his, uh, his definition is that alignment is the complex means by which human beings effect coordinated uh, actions. And more specifically about effective alignment. Uh, one of the studies in language learning claims that uh, interactant, what is effective alignment? They define it as, um, when interactants modify their effective output, modify based on each other's uh, contributions. And uh, I'd like to uh, show you another example where um, effective alignment is uh, uh, plays a role, I believe plays a role in learning a proverb and specifically capturing the rhythm of a proverb. This is where uh, mimicry and synchrony uh, are particularly important. So uh, the teacher was before in this class, the teacher was introducing um, the proverb, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. And here she uh, makes a connection to real life and she uh, does it in a humorous manner. She says that now, you can be walking around and saying that. So she first focuses on the rhyming words. And then as you watch this, uh, pay attention to the movements that are made synchronously in the rhythm. 
uh, by this student and uh, by this student. Keeps the doctor away. Do you hear rhyming? An apple a day keeps the doctor away. Do you hear rhyming words in there? Yep, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Day and away are good rhyming words. And that's the reason that has a nice sound. An apple a day keeps the doctor away. See? So now you can walk around saying that all day. An apple a day keeps the doctor away. So this is just to show that um, uh, synchrony is particularly important when uh, we work on the rhythm of uh, the English language. And it also, you can see the atmosphere, uh, they are smiling and they imitate uh, the teacher's gesture in a rhythm, uh, modify the gesture in their own way. So I think that this excerpt also is an example of effective alignment. Uh, so uh, specifically, I, I, I think we don't have uh, much time left, uh, but maybe I introduce a specific mechanism of uh, how collaborative dialogue and effective alignment are built through gesture. And many of you who do gesture studies and who are using uh, David McNeil's framework, you're very familiar with the notion of catchments. Catchments, and for those who are not, catchments are uh, repetitive uh, gestures that share uh, some common features, features of form and features of meaning. So, for example, we've seen in the first uh, in cat owner excerpt, they used uh, gesture, the catchment that we can call a relationship, both the teacher and student, they imitated each other's catchment and Yes, while well, um, uh, David McNeil and these and Motredon and these studies mostly focused on monological aspects of catchments, where one speaker uses it in a narrative to indicate the major themes. When we uh, look at the classrooms, dialogical aspects of catchments become more important. When the catchment is used, let's say, by the teacher, then imitated by the student or sometimes it's the opposite, okay? So uh, in uh, the current studies show that catchments are used extensively. And what's interesting, they are used in teaching and learning uh, all range of language aspects from lexical meanings to grammatical concepts uh, pronunci and pronunciation and concepts in academic writing. So the gestural imitation, the use of catchments, and they can be called as uh, 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 similar terms, return gestures and other, are quite pervasive in classroom interaction and probably interaction in general. So uh, what's the role of catchments in collaborative dialogue? Students appropriate teacher gesture and then they use it as a tool for their learning. But interestingly, that teachers also appropriate student gesture. And in that case, they can use it as a pedagogical tool. And I'll show you an example. And this gestural imitation is important because imitation, according to Vygotsky, is a primary mechanism for learning, which is supported by, uh, which has a neuro, uh, basis, neurological basis in uh, mirror neurons. You can read more uh, about it. Uh, so what are the functions of uh, dialogical catchments as um, identified uh, in, my, in my dissertation? They maintain coherence of classroom discourse. They achieve, help to achieve shared understanding and to build rapport and effective alignment, as we've seen. Uh, so uh, here are the examples of uh, um, catchments helping to maintain coherence when they talked about different synonyms of uh, spot, 
and they say different words, place, location, point, but uh, the teacher and students use the same uh, catchment, the same similar, a similar gesture that shows this uh, bounded uh, space. In this sense, the <clears throat> catchment helps to maintain uh, coherence. <clears throat> Sorry, not only among uh, synonyms, but also among speakers, across speakers. <clears throat> okay, and um, uh, there's another, here's another example of uh, this here, uh, catchments are co-constructed, which means that the teacher introduces, uh, they are uh, talking about the meaning of best and better. So the students thought those are synonyms. The teacher e e explains the difference between better and best uh, as different levels, uh, degrees of comparison. So the teacher introduces this uh, gesture for better. Then uh, when she talks about best, she is not using any gesture. Then uh, this student uh, contributes, he, he clarifies, he says better, best means more than better. And he uses this gesture. Then uh, the fellow student is trying to uh, produce her, to understand the meaning of best. And she hesitates and she raises her hand. And then she says best. And it's funny to her that she raises very high, uh, so she laughs, or maybe because she feels awkward. And then the teacher builds upon um, her gesture, and she says, yes, the highest, the best. So here they build upon each other's catchments in trying to arrive at a proper understanding of the levels of comparison. And uh, as I said, not only students imitate teachers' gesture, but teachers sometimes imitate uh, students' gesture. And then this, these are teachers' hands. They use a gesture for crab. And then the teacher uses this gesture to explain more about the meaning of crab to, uh, with, to explain to the other students. So she uses student gesture as a pedagogical tool. So maybe I will move to <clears throat> recommendations. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, before I uh, we talk about recommendations, I'd like to uh, pose a question posed by Meryl Swain in that same plenary. Uh, she emphasizes that not only positive emotions are important in classroom interaction, but also negative ones when students struggle in trying to come up with their understanding of the language concepts. So we really need to listen, she says, we need to listen to the student gesture to, um, to um, try to see their understanding and their uh, emotion as expressed in gesture. So to uh, summarize, uh, I'd like to draw some practical implications for the use of gesture in language learning classroom. Of course, uh, it's impossible to provide uh, rules of thumb, how to use gesture, in which cases. Uh, but first of all, both teachers and students should be aware of the importance of uh, gesture in collaboration. Uh, that means, and uh, teachers should also use gesture for um, building rapport, for attracting students' attention and making their uh, explanations more me memorable through effective alignment. Teachers should also try to use gestures in explaining language concepts, visualizing them. And uh, very important, they should intentionally draw students' attention to the gestures used by the teacher. Uh, we know this from a Golden Meadows work. And they, in fact, they should encourage students to use gesture as they conceptualize and discuss uh, ideas. And I think I should uh, stop.
here. And thank you so much for your attention. Uh, in Ukrainian, and then uh, we can open the floor for questions.